I'm Jen Taylor Skinner, and this is The Electorate. On this episode, I have a conversation with the president of the National Women's History Museum, Frederick Irwin. The National Women's History Museum was founded in 1996, and it's an innovative cultural institution and online museum dedicated to uncovering, interpreting, and celebrating women's diverse contributions. Frederick joins me to discuss their current exhibit, which is titled, We Who Believe in Freedom, Black Feminist DC. The exhibit traces Black feminism in Washington, D.C., from the turn of the 20th century through the civil rights movement and on through to Black power movements of today. In our conversation, we talk about the contributions of civil rights leaders like Dorothy Height and leaders in the reproductive justice movement like Loretta Ross. Exhibits like this are so important because they highlight the ways in which the work of Black feminists have served to guide ongoing activism and modern social justice movements. I learned so much in this conversation. So without further ado, here is my conversation with the president of the National Women's History Museum, Frederick Irwin. Frederick Irwin, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jen. I'm delighted to be here. So your current exhibit at the National Women's History Museum is titled, We Who Believe in Freedom, Black Feminists DC. And you explore the biographies of of Black feminist activists, right? And that includes everyone from Loretta Ross, the reproductive justice activist, right? And Anna Mae Horn, who was an anti-poverty activist and a welfare rights advocate. And I first want to talk about the distinction between traditional feminism and what people think of as traditional feminist activism and Black feminist activism. Because I think when most people think about the history of feminist activism, the assumption is, is that it was inclusive. But you only need to dig a bit deeper to see that it wasn't actually that inclusive at all, right? Um, It was exclusive along racial lines and perhaps along class lines. So why was there, why was it necessary to fork feminism into this faction of Black feminism and how do they differ? All right, Jen. So if you don't mind, I want to give you a little bit of context before we jump right into your question. Um, When the National Women's History Museum decided to open an exhibit, specifically Black Feminist DC, um, we were testing a hypothesis that it's very important to bring smaller exhibits to highly accessible places like a public library. If you've been to the MLK Library in DC, you know it's right in the middle of the city, recently renovated. It's absolutely beautiful. And so the reason um, we wanted to put it there is we believe that when you bring stories of local women that people in that own city don't even know about, and you share them at a national narrative level, all of a sudden you inspire people from that part of the country, from that city to go, oh my gosh, this happened here. Or These women were just like me or they're from my own neighborhood. So that's that was kind of, and by the way, it, it's exactly what's happened, right? We've seen so many field trips come in and, and we're hoping to do more of these field trips across the country. So then your question around, you know, why specifically Black feminism versus just feminism in general? And I I wasn't on the curation team, so I can't tell you exactly what our curators were thinking. But I don't believe that it started with, a, you know, the exhibit must be about Black feminism versus feminism in general. It started with a, oh, my goodness, there were so many incredible African-American women in Washington, D.C., who are at the forefront of some of these massive uh, developments and, and things that were happening whose stories weren't told. And by the way, many of them happen to be Black women. And, and so that was kind of what really bubbled up, which was there's a whole, there's a whole swath of women out of Washington who like some of the ones you mentioned, as well as Reverend Polly Murray and Ophelia Settle, like who just weren't necessarily known that we wanted to make sure um, people told, we told their stories. Now, one of the things that you may have heard, there's a woman named Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined this term in 1989 called intersectional feminism. And it's really this concept that when we stand in solidarity with one another and question power structures, we're speaking out against inequality for more than just one area, one kind of a person. And that is really at the heart of Black feminism. And so, you know, I, I often say Black feminism is very inclusive feminism, whereas going back to your original statement, what people maybe first heard about feminism or first thought about feminism might not have been. Um, Felt very much like a bunch of white women saying, you know, we want to have the vote and we want this and not necessarily inclusive. 
Right, right. And that brings me to the first person I want to talk about. Um, mm-hmm. And I have kind of a, a personal, not a personal connection, but Loretta Ross. One of my very first interviews on the electorate was talking about reproductive justice. And that was my introduction to the idea of reproductive justice, which goes beyond reproductive rights. And she had this idea of expanding reproductive rights, not just your right to have an abortion, but your right to you know, raise your family and have a family and the way that you imagine. So can you talk a bit about Loretta Ross and her role in reproductive justice? I will. Um, I, again, I am not a historian, so I always suggest that folks go to uh, womenshistory.org to get the official biographies done by our historians. But I... I am completely taken by Loretta Ross. I I think that this woman is truly one of my heroes. And the reason I say that is that she overcame so much and got so many no's. Um, So for folks who don't know her story um, and it's public information, she was first sexually assaulted at the age of eight. She was then sexually assaulted again at the age of 15 which led to a pregnancy, which um, she had, which then caused her to be kind of ostracized, if you will, in high school by some of the teachers that really were supportive. And, you know, she ended up not being able to go to her first college of choice and found her way to Howard. When she was at Howard University, she then went, if I recall, to a, um, a health clinic at Howard and was given an IUD, which at the time was called the Dalton Shield, which led her to have all sorts of inflammatory issues and eventually led to complications that led to sterilization. And while she was realizing that, she realized that folks were aware that the shield was actually um, had lots of issues with it and that this was happening to many women, specifically many black women at the time. And so some folks will, will say that this is really kind of where she started thinking about reproductive rights and, and really kind of where it started for her personally. But over time, what she also realized is that sexual assault wasn't all, only a racial issue um, in that, you know, in, in the U.S. still today, one in four women either experience an attempted or completed rape. Um, and so she realized that this is a pervasive issue among all races. And so she really began advocating for women who were victims of sexual assault, but also while emphasizing Black women's rights. So she did both at the same time and she never stopped. I mean, even as of last year, I believe she, she, last year being 2022, she was still getting awards for, for her work. So she is one of the women whom I love to tell the younger generations about, because I say, if you think that, if you think that all of this is new, (laughs) that, you know, that what we're fighting is new, like you have to understand what these women were doing, like, you know, just that this was happening in the seventies. Like when people were born, this was happening. That shield was being in, inserted into people back, you know, when we, if you're in your forties, when we were kids. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, is there something yeah. that was specific to DC that drew so many of these black feminist activists? You know, um, one thing that I will say, and at our exhibit at the MLK Library, we have this screen where you can touch anyone who's featured in the screen and you see where they might have come together at in the city. And so right. it's really, really neat, actually, because it goes back to this concept of Black feminism is inclusive feminism, meaning women were gathering together and talking about certain issues and where they were gathering, for example, one of the most common areas with Howard University drew some women together who were absolutely, you know, instrumental in a variety of different ways. But you also see a place like the S Street Salon that was also a place in Washington where women were gathering to have these important conversations. One of the most popular things that we've seen this year at the museum is uh, we partnered with an organization that uh, it's called a tour of her own, and it allows you to tour Washington, D.C., and hear the women's history. And specifically, if you want, it can tie to the exhibit. So it's not just about learning about Loretta Ross and Dr. Reverend Murray or whomever you're, you know, you're interested in. 
it's actually seeing physically, like where were they meeting? So whether or not there was something specific going on, I think there was a lot of a lot of new things happening. There was a lot of activism happening. There was a lot of new um, rape centers that were opening for the first time. You know, I think that there was a lot of, there was just a lot of momentum, um, frankly, driven primarily by, by African-American women. Well, I want to talk about another really important figure in reproductive rights, and that was Ophelia Settle Egypt, right? She was born mm -hmm. in 1903. Yep. There are lots of parallels to Loretta Ross's story, <laughs> um, you know, but she was trained as a social worker and she founded, I think, one of the first Planned Parenthood centers in D.C. Yes, um, she was known as a medical social worker and kind of a women's rights person. Um, but what made her special to me personally is that she was instrumental in going and beginning to tell or gather and document the stories of people whose stories were not being told, specifically former slaves or people who had been um, descendants of folks who had been, I mean, a number of, she was going all over the country and making sure that this was being captured and it eventually led to some very well-known research. And so she was at, at her core, a storyteller, which I think is so incredibly important because from our perspective, only 15% of what's taught in the United States across, you know, social studies classes is about women's history. And of that 15%, half is in a domestic capacity. So anyone who sets out right out of the gate to say, I'm going to tell the untold stories is someone that we admire very, very much. I think that as she also faced issues of, of access to education and, um, one of the things that she kept coming back to was she became a social worker and she became really kind of interested in medical social work. So access to, to yes, access to Planned Parenthood, access to choice, access to options. Um, and that was one of the things that she started in Washington, D.C. You're right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, several of the women in the exhibit were actually artists. And I think that's really an interesting angle because they intertwine their artistry with their activism. Yeah. Right. And yeah. one that I'm pretty interested in, it's Bernice Johnson Reagan. And she was born in 1942 and she was a musician, a, a historian and a composer. So how did she mm -hmm. use her creative background to kind of boost her activism? Tell us a bit about her. You know, she's not somebody that I, um, I know off the top of my head well enough to um, share that story. And we, cause we have at least 20 different folks in that um, right. exhibit. But what I will tell you is that again, that concept of using an art form, whether it's through music or poetry or writing in order to tell stories, in order to drive activation or change is something that is highly relevant still today. Right. And so one of the things that, um, that I do love is, yes, that exhibit explores that. You can see many of the different books that were written, um, some of the poetry and some of the music. One of the things we've learned at the museum is that if you really want to inspire folks today of a current generation, and this is the same as it was back then, you have to bring in that intersection between art, artists, and what's happening in that moment, meaning there's an incredible power behind this artistic movement around any sort of activist issue. And so that's, that's really kind of what the exhibit was trying to highlight, but it's also what we see today. Um, at, you know, there are some, there's a woman who recently I participated in her particular project, which is capturing women in a state of rage. So she oh. photographs women who are screaming. And I'll tell you what, it is something <laughs> else. Her name is Whitney Bradshaw. It is something else to not only be photographed, but also to be asked to scream while you're being photographed and scream something. So you're not just screaming, but you're screaming something like, you know, you know, bleep, bleep, uh, rape <laughs> or like whatever. Right, right? Right, right. And so so that rage and that and capturing that and capturing the stories through music or poetry um, was really important back in the early 1900s, but still today. 
Right. You're right. And and you're right. There's so many women in the exhibits and so many artists. I think that Mary Burrell, who was a playwright and some other writers are there. So you get a really rich, you know, view, a broad view of the women who are in D.C. Yeah. You know, when I think about your exhibit and the breadth of the activism of the women who are featured in the exhibit, it reminds me of a quote I heard from someone once. You know, they said when black women have the keys to the bus <laughs> that they bring everybody along on the ride. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and, yes. I, and I love that analogy because it's so perfect. And, you know, it, and I think your exhibit perfectly encapsulates that kind of strain of, of activism. But I mean, do you think that, you know, understanding the history of these women and understanding, how, you know, the ways in which they were activists, do you think that informs today's activism, feminist activism and the women who are kind of starting movements now? I mean, I should hope so. You know, one of the one of the things I came to the museum last spring, so I've been here just about eight months and the exhibit had just opened when I arrived and it's done really well. In fact, it just won an award last week, I think, a Muse oh, wow. Award, a Gold Award um, for its technology enablement. Um, but what I have struggled with and part of what I'm leaning into, which answers your question, is what I call technology accessibility. So it's, you know, yes, you can be um, on the other coast and learn a lot about the women in this exhibit online. But if you didn't know about this exhibit, if you didn't know that you could access it online or that if you'd been in Washington, you'd seen it, how would you know about these women? And so... Yes, I genuinely think that these women can and should be at the forefront of today's activist generation's mind and give them a sense of comfort that they are, you know, that they are standing on the shoulders of these incredible women. And I'm not sure that that is something that we can say is happening enough today. I am really trying to make sure that with this exhibit and others that we lean in much more to this technology accessibility piece, such that it's further integrated, not just on social media, not just online, but in other ways too. Right. Um, when I was thinking about asking you that question and thinking about, about what I learned in the exhibit, I was thinking about some of the movements that have been recently started and how they may have been informed by this work specifically, like just take the student loan forgiveness, right? That kind of movement and yeah. where we are today, even 10 years ago, talking about student loan forgiveness, there wasn't this understanding of how that issue might've affected black women or other groups, other marginalized groups, right? Or even the reproductive justice movement, right? I mean, I think Loretta Ross opening that up, we don't just think about that in terms of women or wealthy women, you know, we think about it in terms of the LGBTQ community. So all of these new activist, you know, movements, I think they kind of start now with this intersectional lens. And I think that that is thanks to a lot of the work that was done by these black activists. For sure. There's a, a woman named Martha Jones. She's a scholar out of John Hopkins, and she was very involved in, in um, helping us with the development of this particular exhibit. Yeah. And she recently wrote a book. Her latest book is called Vanguard, The Vanguard. Right. And she says that Black women have been the, at the forefront of every major alliance dating back to abolition, right? So that's what her book really kind of pulls the thread on. So I think for anyone who's listening, who's interested in learning more, she's a fantastic resource. Um, you know, the, the National Women's History Museum, when it started nearly 30 years ago, yeah. um, it started as an online virtual museum. And in part because it was working very hard to get approval for a, a brick and mortar physical space. And today, what I would say is, well, and that happened, it happened just a few years ago. And thanks to that work, there will eventually be a Women's History Museum in the future. However, today, it's more important than ever, I think, that there is um, access to information like this podcast, like online exhibits, like social media that continue to tell these stories. Because if they're just static in an exhibit or in a collection, it's, it's taking too long. You yeah. know what I mean? It's too long Absolutely. to hope that someone's going to walk in and be inspired and read quickly enough and absorb and go do something. Right, exactly. Is there anything that's upcoming, any exhibits that are upcoming that you're excited about? So actually, I should say today we just launched a new online exhibit mm -hmm. on Title IX, okay. um, which it, one of my favorite things about that exhibit, and admittedly, I haven't seen the whole thing from in depth yet because it just launched, but when I first came to the museum, young women used to say to me all the time, 
hey, I just learned about this or I just learned about this and can you believe it? But like, what can I do about it? And so I started telling our education team, our historians, as you put together anything, any exhibit, including this Title IX exhibit, everything must have a call to action. It's not enough to learn. You have to, we must also share kind of how folks can get more interested in learning about Title IX, about making sure that it's incorporated in their states and their schools. And, you know, and so that's one of my favorite things about this future exhibit is the call to action piece, especially. Yeah. Well, Fred Irwin, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for this conversation. And thank you for, you know, telling us about these incredible women. Thank you, Jen. I'm so excited that you're going in this direction and that you're telling these stories too. I mean, it's, it's awesome. I appreciate your time. <laughs>